Welcome back once again, you beautiful nerds. I am Wildfire One. You are watching and listening to Nerds New New Sexy Entertainment, the podcast. This is episode 155. This is a mini boss episode. With me today is Clovis Die. Welcome once again. You've heard him uh, when we did uh, the Mermaid Hunters game, and I think he's been on. He was on a podcast when we actually interviewed the Mermaid Hunters creators. Uh, the well, the magical land magical. of Yelp. Magical Land of Yell. Yeah. So um, he's here again today with us to talk about something really informative that I know mm, very poquito on. Uh, what what are we talking about, Clovis? The Famicom Disk Drive. You might better know the Famicom in the U.S. as the Nintendo Entertainment System. They're basically the same thing. I know there's differences, but we're going to say they're basically the same thing because... We could be spending entire weeks of episodes trying to explain that difference. So, and he's talking about, there's like a literally floppy disk drive, not like a CD drum, because I'm sure a lot of you, you youngsters nowadays will, don't even know what we're talking about when we say floppy disk. But it was, uh, how, how, big, how big would you say a floppy disk can carry as far as like memory? Well, that depends on the floppy disk. I mean, they went everywhere from barely holding... 128 kilobytes to near the end carrying a little bit over a megabyte of data uh, of course we're not right. counting the super discs near the end but by yeah. then cds are already out well okay well how about this how much did the uh famicom drive hold 128 128 uh megs or kb 128 kilobits. Okay, just just for the younger even, the younger people out there. That way they know our, our they knew our plight. They knew our problem, you know. Okay, so the original Nintendo and Famicom cartridges, Famicom being short for family computer, Japan likes taking words and smashing them together. Pokemon. The original Famicom and NES cartridges held about 48 kilobits. These are kilobits, not kilobytes. A, kilob a byte is 8 bits. Yeah. This was almost nothing at all. You oh. could sneeze out more data. Nowadays, it's nothing at all. Back then, it was, eh, something, you know. Yes, yes. So... At the time, this idea that we could take this up to, I'm sorry, 112 kilobyte bits. Okay. It went up to 112 kilobits. This, the idea was, well, we've done all we can with cartridges. We're going to have to s slap a disk drive on the bottom to make bigger games because cartridges aren't getting bigger. It just, this costs too much, but these disks are cheap. That And that makes sense. So about what year would you say this whole story started the famicom disk drive came out in 1986 actually right about now it came out february 21st 1986 okay okay so that's very interesting kids for um if ever you ever listen to mp3s which is what you use as what this way um while and i listen to music before everyone just went to youtube and spotify if you ever listen to an mp3 Odds are your MP3 is already like a hundred times bigger than what we're talking about right now. <laughs> oh yeah, and I think I think a basic, a basic MP3 is at least a meg plus. Yeah, um, it can. It is often like around um, two, three megabytes, maybe four or five. Yeah, and before that, we had WAV files, which were ridiculously huge. Um, yes, but uh, yeah. So the, you said this came out. Uh, what would you say, 88? 1986, February 86. 21. Like I said, it's almost an anniversary. That's fucking awesome. Nintendo had this great idea while designing the Famicom and also the NES, although we never really use it over here. What if we wanted to add stuff to the system later on? DLC without it, being DLC. Yes. What if we wanted to create an orgy of hardware fucking each other? Because that's <laughs> basically what it looks like. You're looking at the picture right now. I'm, I'm, look, I'm, look at, well, I'm looking at it on the website. It's the Famicom's on top of the uh, like this big this red is... box. <laughs> if, there, if ever there was a more sexual image involving consoles, I have not seen it. Yet. Fair enough. Because <laughs> it's probably what out there. Anyways, Nintendo got this idea that they could expand the capabilities of the system 
through hardware expansion ports. You would be able to connect things, and the system would have more abilities. Almost all of their systems have had these expansion ports up through about, I would say, the GameCube, and then they stopped. They've almost never used them. Well, it's probably that that port in the back of the NES that no one like really knew yes. what it was, what it did. Yeah. Yes. You had that little cover you had to pull off on the bottom, mm -hmm. and there was a connector there. Exactly. They almost thought they were going to bring this disk drive to the U.S. You'll notice the earliest U.S. models came out test marketing in late 1985. So we already technically had the Nintendo Entertainment System just as they were getting ready to launch this in Japan. Okay. And they at the time thought we'd be getting it too. Now we didn't. And some people are like, wow, we missed out on all this stuff. Well, I'm here to talk about the Famicom, how it did in Japan, why we didn't get it, and would it have changed much if we had? As we covered, the Famicom disk drive is this red brick you connect to the bottom of the Famicom. Yeah. It actually Basically. doesn't look like it's connected. I mean, it's probably connected in the back, but it doesn't look like it's yeah, connected it's connected in the back by a wire. Yeah, it's just, it just looks like it's piggybacking off this giant red brick. You connect this giant red brick and connect a black box on top. Oh, God, the sexual metaphors just keep going. The NES is taking it both ends here. Yes. The more I look at the more I look at this picture, the more I think about, yep, it's just, uh, that's, oh. that's how the SNES was born. Oh, God. Um... Anyway, you attach this giant red brick, and basically what you gain is the ability to load and run games off these disc floppy disks. The idea was, okay, so floppy disks, they cost less to make, they have more space, and also, the ability to save your game is built in. It's a floppy disk. You can write to the disk, so saving is free. You don't have to put special hardware in the cartridge to allow saving. And also... Well, if the person doesn't like the game anymore, well, they can take it to a special kiosk at stores in Japan, hmm. put it on a disc, pay a small fee, and we'll overwrite the game with a new one for less than the cost of the game because we don't have to give them a new disc. That's kind of cool, I guess. I, yes. I can see how that's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. It was on paper. It seemed like a great idea. And Nintendo was all doubled down on it, and a bunch of other companies at first... Like, okay, we're going to do this. They got Capcom on board. They got Konami on board. They got a bunch of other companies. And a whole, to about 200 games got released for it. Now on, I'm going to give you... On disc. Yes. Okay. Now, it didn't do bad, but I'm. it didn't also didn't do well. Here's the thing, Zine, you know. We sold about 20 million Famicoms in Japan between the system's launch in 1983... And when they finally discontinued it in Japan in the early aughts, yeah, they kept selling it in Japan well longer than they did here. No new games are coming out, but they kept making them. Well, I, I, it makes sense. I guess if people are still buying, supply and demand is still a thing. But Okay, so now I want you to keep in mind, here's your first hint. Something is not right here, okay? Okay. So they sold about 20 million of the, of the system in Japan. They only sold 4.4 million disk drives. Yeah, there's that. That tells me that maybe it wasn't as popular as they had hoped it to be. Now I'll tell you right now, that's not the worst thing Nintendo's ever done. I mean, it's not the Virtual Boy. That's what I was gonna. I was just gonna say the Virtual Boy. Like, uh, it, it the Virtual Boy was uh, is a whole other podcast. That uh, oh fuck that thing. Now on the other hand, everyone says the Wii U is an abject failure, and it still did better than this. But and if it, you you made a good point right now, it did make uh, it did did do better than the floppy disk drive for the uh, Famicom. Shortly after it came out, we quickly started discovering problems. Now, as you said, many of the kids in the audience they don't even know what a floppy disk drive is, mm -hmm. let alone what floppy disks were like in the eighties. Mm -hmm. See, if you had a computer in the nineties, which is when most people started to have computers. You never got the 80s experience, even if you had a floppy disk drive. See, back in the 80s, 
These things were fragile motherfuckers. Oh yeah, you could just I mean you drop it, you damage it. And yeah, they weren't could, and they weren't like the floppy disks that you remember. Like you, you could think you think floppy disks and I mean, if we're talking about the floppy disks I remember, they're big black <laughs> floppy like before the smaller ones, and then the smaller ones became plastic. Like it was it almost looked like like it was, it was just big and black and floppy. And if you dropped it, and if it got dirty or anything, it just done. Yeah, you, you lost that day. Well, this uh, this is the smaller ones, but it's still not very strong. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now keep in mind, it's always been a controversial issue whether or not games are just for kids. But in the early '80s, when the Nintendo was system was first new there was a lot of mostly kids playing it i'm not saying there weren't adults but there was a lot of mostly kids it was it was um it was like the nintendo and and games like atari and all that were actually at the time uh made for children it was made for younger a younger uh, generation yes you know and and it really wasn't an adult's kind of thing and it's also back then especially in japan there was a a mindset to where like it's not like it is now if it's cutesy they love it now you had if you were a man you had to be a man you had to be <laughs> you had to be you 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 didn't have time to do that shit you had to work 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 make babies do whatever you got to do you had to be a man and video games weren't just weren't a manly thing first the first problem they quickly ran into the most obvious one kids aren't the cleanest and even kid even if you're not a kid accidents happen oh yeah spilt milk so stuff got dropped stuff got dirty these discs could almost stop working if you looked at them funny so already people were starting to run into issues where the game just stopped working yeah but even better what if it's not the game that stopped working so wild ever worked on a car or anything with moving parts yeah so you know what a belt is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it you makes things belt. turn. Yes. And belts break, don't they? After a while, yes. Anything that especially, has wear and tear. Especially if they're cheaply made, right? Oh, you're telling me that they're that the Nintendo put together a che- a cheaply made product? <gasps> Oh, I'm so surprised. I got to say this. A cheaply made product. Have you ever had trouble with your uh, Joy-Cons? Cheaply made product. I I know there's people Uh. that are probably going to shit themselves when I say this. But it's true. The Joy... That fucking... The Drift is a bitch. And fuck you, Disney, for not fixing that yet. Or Disney. Fuck you, Nintendo. (laughs) Just as bad... Fuck you, Nintendo, for not fixing that yet. <laughs> yes, well, I'm Mickey. You know I fucked your joy cons. <laughs> That's what happened. Okay, anyways. Yes. That's beautiful. The disk drive had a belt because it had a physical magnetic platter that had to actually be turning. Or it wouldn't be able to read the, uh, the drive. Yeah. Correct. Well... We don't know how well Nintendo thought it was going to be, but their testing didn't include enough long-term theoretical. Within less than two years, sometimes I've heard it was a wrap, even within six months, these belts were breaking. And that makes sense. Now, could you replace a belt yourself if you had the right knowledge? That didn't mean every customer did. Well, also, you got to remember back then was a different time. Like, we know more now about certain electronics than we did not then. That was still kind of a new uh, technology at the time. So, yes, like, a lot of people didn't know how to fucking replace a belt. And you weren't going on to YouTube and looking up someone's tutorial. There mm-hmm. was no YouTube. Nope, there were there books. No- that you had to buy. There was no internet. And if you went to the library for a book, they probably didn't have a book on how to fix the belt in your... In, your, in this new product. Time. This yes. new product that just came out probably like within six months. So already we have some unhappy customers because the disk drives are fragile. The disks are fragile. It's made and with subpar parts. Yes. And 
you got to go through sometimes quite lengthy load processes because, well, while if you use a computer back then, how long does it take to load shit from a disk drive back then? I, you know what? I try to not remember that time because, <laughs> because it was so ridiculous. I think, I think, uh, I might still be waiting, <laughs> but no, uh, it took about it, depending on what you played and what it was and how graphic uh, heavy it was, it probably took about to load probably about three minutes. Well, some of these games would have software on the, both the front and the back of the disc so at points of the game, something you never did in a cartridge. Yeah. Yeah. You'd take it out. You'd flip it over. You'd load some more. So, it wasn't the most elegant experience. It was breakage prone. The system was, and keep in mind, the system was already more expensive than the base unit. Yeah. And the discs were likely to just wank out on you at any random moment. Think of a floppy disk, especially the old floppy disks. Uh, and I'll, I'll, this one this one is just like the floppy disk, kind of like, I want to say like 2.0, which is the square uh, with the actual disk inside it. But what I'm trying to say is think of it more like a really thin um, record. And I know that's probably yes. probably too old for some of you guys, too. But <laughs> you, you know those things the DJ uses? You know, the scratch? You put the record on that, and it, it played music <laughs> once upon a time. Uh, but anyway, it's literally it's literally a super thin record, and if you ever scratch a record, you know that it's it, the music's not unplayable, but it's it's damaged, it's corrupted. That information on there is gone, in one way or another, at least one part. So if you did that to something like a floppy disk, which it just if you damage it, it's done. So uh, Clovis, how how much would you say this add-on to the Famicom would be at that time? Ah, yes, the cost. My mistake, it says here it was being sold for $80, basically, in the U.S. U.S. money. Keep in mind, the NES itself was being sold for, un for like, a about 100 yeah. when it first hit the U.S. I think, yeah, I think the NES was about 100, 150 around there, give or take. I don't remember, man. I, I don't either. Um, I was a kid when I got mine. I was probably six, seven or eight, but uh, that's beside the point. So... 80 but you said 80 bucks for this add-on 80 bucks in 1980s money man you got to do some inflation adjustment oh yeah it's def that's definitely a little bit more money um so what kind of things did this add-on do like you said well, additions like give, give us some give us some uh, examples it did basically three things it let you run bigger games although we'll get to the problem with that in a moment okay it let you save your game because it's a disk. You can just write the save data to the disk. Mm -hmm. And here's the one big part we actually, I would argue, we missed out on in the U.S. Okay. It added an FM synthesis chip to the uh, NES's hardware that expanded its music capabilities. Ah, it added audio hardware. A hardware. That's yes. kind of cool. It added an extra, an extra music channel, basically. Some people really like FM synthesis, and some people don't. It's definitely quite the debate. I'm not going to get anywhere near that. In some cases where we got games that were on the disk drive in Japan, mm -hmm. the music was usually different, a, a bit different in the U.S. It would be the same song about the FM synthesis, but not just the not just like they took out the synthesis. It'd be arranged differently. Huh? Sometimes you can look up, for instance, the opening song for the Japanese version and the U.S. version of Legend of Zelda are a different. Huh, I was not aware of that. That's kind of cool. And it's basically because we didn't have this FM synthesis when we got the game. The, sa the sound would be different. I'm not going to say it's better. Some people think it's better. Some people think what we got on the NES is actually superior to the Japanese song. Huh. It really depends on how you think FM synthesis sounds. Yeah, that and, I mean, nostalgia is a very powerful feeling. Um, True. You know, like, I can't hear anything other than the old NES for that anyway. If I heard something different, I'd probably be like, uh, I don't, I'm not feeling Yes. That. That's what it gave people as benefits. Bigger games, saving, and FM synthesis. Now, as we've already covered, the belt liked to break. 
And the discs were weak to almost everything, being looked at, funny. Um, you talked about it. It probably broke. Being talked at, having low self-esteem, magnets, dirt. Emotional you know, damage. We're not we're not joking about the magnets, people. Magnets were actually fuck your floppies up right hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they'll do hard drives now. I mean, and just about anything that's... Uh, I mean, have you ever put a magnet against your TV? I'd suggest not doing that. I don't think it works on the newer TVs, Wild. Huh? Really? Like the LEDs and all that? Yeah, it doesn't It doesn't do what you're expecting. You're expecting to see that Gauss pattern you'd get back on the old CRTs when you yeah, held up well, a the, magnet and just the fucked CRTs, everything up yeah. oil. The CRTs, it would fucking ruin. Like, it... Oh, okay. I thought, I thought it did... It just messed with, like, the... Like the, I don't know. Either way. No. I'll, 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 you'll never see me do it because I don't want to fuck my television up. That's all I'm saying. You're, you're not going to get what, you, what you're thinking of. You're mm. not going to get that weird-ass effect that we'd have where you hold a magnet next to a CRT and you just create a drug. series of waves in it. You, you, you created a drug trip is what happened. It was literally yes. like, like a Scooby-Doo drug trip. It was bad. So, And then we ran into problem number three. The one that Nintendo actually cared about the most. Okay. So, Nintendo thought they had this great copy protection scheme, okay? People can only use it if it's an official disc because we've got the word Nintendo stamped into the disc and there's going to be this bar that comes down and if the bar can't fit and the name Nintendo correctly, the disc won't load. Nintendo kind of really didn't think this through so the bar the idea was if if your disc didn't have the nintendo word in it the bar wouldn't come all the way down here is what nintendo didn't think through okay so there was this indentation on the disc with nintendo's name on it that this bar would come down into and if the bar fit the disc would be allowed to load okay well you know what the bar will also go down into an even bigger opening with no words in it huh so they just make a so they just make an indentation that was a rectangle with no Nintendo's name in it. So we didn't use your name. So the pirates would make blanks for it. Huh. Where the Nintendo name indentation was on the disc, it would just be this rectangular area. The bar would still fit in it, and the system wouldn't know any better. And <laughs> piracy went off the hook. Oh. Then, and that's, of course, what Nintendo cared about because they were losing money. Well, Nintendo kind of stuck with it for a little while, not sure what, what they should do. Nintendo's like, uh, we sold this to people. We told everyone this is the future. We told everyone we're not releasing games on cartridge anymore. Uh, do, what, 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 what do we do? So for a while in Japan, Nintendo kept releasing games. But you can watch as all the other companies, like Capcom, Konami, everyone else, they kind of jumped ship and went back to cartridges. Because they were getting ripped off. It was insanely easy for pirates to copy. Nintendo, <laughs> they didn't really think this through. Like, but what, 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 if your, what if your bar would fit any indentation big enough? The discs break. The drive breaks. And the games are really stupidly easy for anyone with a... Now, keep in mind, not everyone had disk drives at home where they could copy shit. Yeah. But if you did, then you could be copying games left and right. So, like I said, everybody else started jumping ship. And for a while longer, Nintendo kept supporting it... Not wanting to lose space and admit they fucked up. <laughs> They're kind of like, well, shit. Um, we just told everyone this is the future, and we're not doing cartridges anymore. And, um, uh, yeah, oh, oh, God. Yeah, but anyway, so here's what happened. Nintendo of America was looking at this play out in Japan, and their answer was, so, guys, cartridges are getting bigger. We, we got this crazy idea. How about we don't bring over your disk drive and we just use bigger cartridges? So many of those games that were only on the disk drive in Japan 
came to the U.S. on a cartridge. On bigger cartridges. Yes, bigger cartridges, because as time went on, the memory in the cartridges got cheaper and cheaper, so cartridges kept getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So instead, we just got bigger cartridges with no, with no floppy disks that broke if they got emotional damage, no belts that broke because dirt got in, and they were a lot harder to pirate, especially back then. Yeah. So Nintendo of America was like, no, we're not doing that. Uh, how yeah. big How big was the uh, the memory on the original cartridge compared to now, do you know? Or compared to then, like afterwards? Well, I don't know at that exact moment. Mm -hmm. but by the time the NES was on its way out and the Super Nintendo was coming in, let me make a point. The size of the cartridge used in Super Mario Brothers 3 is the exact same size of the cartridge used for Super Mario World. They were getting pretty big as time went on. Okay. Yeah, you know, technology moves forward, that's for sure. So, the only thing we didn't have in that cartridge was the extra sound channel. That makes sense. Because they weren't going to put a whole synthesis chip in there. Yeah. I mean, even later on, cartridges started having additions like uh, FX chips... I don't yes. know about sound, uh, any sound chips. There might have been. I, I'm not aware of that. Well, but. yes and no. Actually, after the disk drive bombed out in Japan, everyone else jumped ship. Some companies actually tried putting an FM synthesis chip in their cartridges in Japan. Huh. We did not get any of that here. Although we did get a few of the games, minus the extra sound hardware. For instance, Castlevania 3, which did release on cartridge in Japan, had different music to what we got here because in Japan, it had a whole extra sound chip inside the cartridge. Interesting. Now, here's the weird part. You know why there's no sound chip in the U.S. version? Why? Because Nintendo of America wouldn't let them. Long, long, long story. Not worth going into right now. Okay. But Nintendo of America had a whole line of release policies, and they got to say what you could and couldn't do, and apparently it didn't go with their rules, even though it flew in Japan. What did we do about saving? Well, there was these games got handled saving when they came to the U.S., and some people will say, well, well, if we had the disc drive, all these games would have had saving. I'm not 100% sure about that because, well, we'll talk about what Konami was doing in a moment. There was basically three ways games that had saving on the disc drive handled coming to the U.S. Method one, what saving? We cut it out. You don't get saving in the U.S. Fuck you. This is how Castlevania 1 did it. In Japan... You could save on the disk drive. In the U.S.? Nah, man, you're going to do that in one sitting, bitch. Good luck. Other games? Okay, we had saving in Japan. You get to write down 50 hieroglyphics and don't you dare write one wrong. Mm-hmm. Had some of that in the U.S. Passwords. Oh, <laughs> fuck those things, man. Here's your 50 characters, most of which look like each other. Don't you dare write one down wrong. Mm-hmm. And finally, the third method, they're like, Nintendo of America's like, so what if? Like, but this game required saving. You can't, you can't bring this to the U.S. You didn't have the disk drive. Nintendo of America's like, what if we put a very tiny amount of memory in the cartridge? They're like, okay, but the memory will go dead the moment the power goes off. What if we put a battery in the cartridge, hook up to this very tiny amount of memory, so even if you take the cartridge out of the system, the battery keeps the memory in the cartridge going. And that was our battery backed up memory. That makes sense. So some of the games that had saving on the floppy drive in Japan still had saving in the U.S. And not by way of, remember these 50 characters, don't get one wrong. Yeah, see. Well, well I'm going to talk about two ways. I'm going to talk about how Konami and Capcom handled U.S. releases, Okay. And they couldn't be more batshit different from each other, okay? Mm -hmm. Capcom handling a U.S. release. Wow, you Americans are so stupid. You'd never be able to finish Mega Man 2, so 
We're going to add a new easy mode, call it normal, and make the original difficulty and call that hard because you're too stupid for the game the Japanese people played. Yeah, that, you know what? That was kind of a big way of looking at it when it came to video games that came to America. Meanwhile, Konami's like, oh no, you Americans are going to rent the game, finish it on a rental and never buy it, so we're going to completely screw up the difficulty and make the game 10 billion times harder because we don't want you Americans finishing it. So which is it, Japan? Are we too awesome or are we too stupid? <laughs> We're somewhere in the middle. <sighs> We're awesomely stupid. <laughs> We're awesomely stupid. Oh. I mean, there's a lot of games I never really beat because of, probably because they were fucking ramped up to ridiculous as far as difficulty goes. But... I, there's a lot of games I enjoyed, too, so... So, my point is, had the disc drive come to the U.S., it's quite possible some companies would have left saving in, and Konami would have probably deliberately deleted it out of their paranoia because they were afraid you're going to rent these games in the U.S., finish it on the rental and not buy it. Renting games was legal in the U.S., but not in Japan. Complicated oh. story. We're not going into that. Okay. So, Konami, in fact, the most famous game for Konami utterly fucking a game over in the U.S. because they didn't want us to be able to finish it was Bayou Billy. Okay. The U.S. game is considered brutally difficult to the point of being a sick joke and not worth touching. <laughs> the Japanese game is a pretty easy experience. You can finish 30 minutes easy your first time, probably. No, no, no questions. Okay. That's how much different they are in difficulty. So some people are like, but what about all these games we missed out on? Okay, okay, that, that's the question. 200 games came out on it. By the way, people, we actually got about uh, a fourth of them in the U.S. It wasn't like we couldn't. And most of the games we didn't get, we probably weren't ever going to get. Because at the time... They didn't think the U.S. would get the game, and having the disc drive wasn't really going to change that. Stuff like visual novels. We weren't going to get the Famicom Detective Club back then. Nintendo wasn't going to translate that for you. You weren't, you weren't going to get it. You weren't going to get their murder mystery game. Imagine that would be a lot of work. A lot of translation. They were afraid of detailing a murder in a game because, oh no, oh no, we can't, we can't talk about stuff like that. Mm-hmm. This had all these ideas of what kind of things people in the U.S. wouldn't play. For the most part, I've looked over the list, and most of what we didn't get, we probably weren't going to get. Now, people are like, but what about all these RPGs we could have gotten? Like, actually, people, almost all the RPGs you can think of didn't even release on it. Remember what I said early on? It was not that popular. They often would skip the disk drive just because... There are more, more, more people didn't have it. Remember I said it was like only about 25% of the customers. Yeah, that, and it was easy to... Uh, to pirate, pirate as hell. Yeah. So, games that did not go on the disk drive in Japan. We have Dragon Quest, okay. Final Fantasy, okay. the original Mother with, um, you know, Earthbound Zero, the original Mother game. Yeah, we know. Earthbound. None of these big RPGs were ever on the disk drive. They were all went straight to cartridge. <laughs> In fact, the copy of Dragon Quest we got was actually better than what Japan had. Really? Yes, we got improved graphics. The ability to save was added. Yes, in Japan, they was kind of cheaped out and didn't do saving. Ooh. You had to write down a 40-character password. So, we take, saving. take it, Japan. We won on that one. Yes. Suck it. Yes. We got saving for our Dragon Quest game. The reason in Dragon Quest 1 you had to always go back to the king to save no matter how far away you were in the world was because it was password-based saving. If you look at the Japanese version of Dragon Quest, it is ugly looking. They actually redid all the artwork for the U.S. Huh. And I don't mean like censored it. I mean... It went up massively in quality. So, um, is this drive available to buy, like, for collectors and all that? I'm sure it is. 
If you want to track it down, yes. Probably very expensive because there's so few of them out there. Yes, and you'll often need repair skills because you're probably going to get a fixer upper job because like I said, some of them were dying in six months. Many of them were dying in two years. The odds of finding one that's still working without any refurbished work is kind of a no. And collecting the games is also kind of a really um, dicey fuck you situation. If you just want to play the games, you can. there are ways to burn them to new discs and go from there. Yeah. Actually finding an original copy of some of the games that were released on it. That works. Yes, can be like the holy grail for Japanese collectors. Really hard to find. They broke or they were overwritten. Well, I mean, it, if you know anything about technology, you overwrite something over and over and over and over and over again, you're going to get screwed up data eventually. Yes. So I imagine some of these, some of these, these discs were overwritten I don't know, 50 to 100 times, we'll say. So you're just going to, it's just fucked. They're, it's just, you're going to get a broken disc anyway in the long run. Yep. So that sucks. Um, but like, okay, that makes sense as far as, with all that in mind, as far as getting a working disc, it's probably a diamond in the rough. Yes. Can you get them? Yes. Do, you're going to pay more because there was a time where you probably could have got them more on the cheap, but those days are long dead. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to pay for it now. You can still get them, but you're going to pay for it. And you better know how to open it up and fix it because, as I understand it, they're almost all fixer-uppers. Can you get them working? Well, yes, I've, uh, I, I've seen videos of people fixing them, but these people tend to know what they're doing. In fact, often what they do is they buy them, fix them, and then flip them for even more than what they bought them for. That makes sense for people who want to collect. When would you say the last uh, Famicom disk drive, like when did they stop selling them? Because we went through the rise and fall. We're going to have to talk about the death. It was officially discontinued in 1990. Okay. Apparently, remember those disk writers I talked about? Mm hmm Where they let you rewrite your discs? Sounds like you could buy new stock of the discs and write to them. Up until 2003. Huh. So, if you find a working disc, it's probably not even the, the old one. Probably it's not probably even the original. The one. Yeah, it's probably yeah. not even the original. It's probably one of the better protected disc drives that came out uh, later in the 90s. Yeah, basically they kept selling the floppies all the way up until 2003. And apparently they only discontinued um, tech support for it in 2007. Wow. Oh my God! Wow! They were, uh, and in the same year the Wii came out, they were technically still servicing these disk drives. Wild! You know, you make a mistake, you gotta pay for it. <laughs> and they did. And, and they for did. years to come, they did. <laughs> they were fixing them up until 2007. Fuck! Well, now the more you know. Jesus they Christ. definitely did not just, it was, it was not a pump and dump. They're like, it, it was a mistake and, oh, oh God. This is, this is not the pump, this is not the market pump and dump where you drop all your customers and run. This is having one night of sex and being stuck with the kid for the next 18 years. Oh, yeah. But I will give this to Nintendo. Um, I will give this to them. They, they ran with it. They... Uh, they knew they fucked up, and they they could have they could have just dropped it and said "fuck you guys." You know you're stuck with it. This, we gave you a shitty product; it's yours. Ha <laughs> ha. Good luck. Now instead, they actually continued for years to come to fix these shitty pro this shitty product. And uh, you, you got to give them credit for that. There's something to be said for that. Yep, they definitely at least made honorable by their mistake. They're like, "Wow, this was this was a mistake." I guess we have to support it. Oh, God, what did we do? What did we make? Why did we make this? <laughs> what, what did we create? We created a beast. They, uh, I, like, I like to think that they learned from their mistake a little bit. I mean, that's, honestly, that might even be why they refused the... Uh, well, one of the reasons why they refused the uh, the CD-ROM for the SNES. But that's a whole different oh. story. 
Oh god, the politics between them and Sony. Yeah, that... it may well be why the it may well be why the Nintendo sixty four disc drive never released. If you ever heard of that one, mm-hmm. they sp- they spent like they spent all five years designing it, and then they're like, "Oh god, we're not releasing this." Maybe maybe this disc drive left a bad taste in their mouth that was like years to come, which it, they ended up having to fix. You know, to to fix that years to come. And maybe that was the constant reminder of maybe we sh- they they went like maybe we shouldn't do a disc drive maybe we shouldn't do a CD let's not do any additions that's a bad idea and that maybe that's what keeps reminding them not to do that you know maybe there's a reason that's one of the reasons we don't see certain things on some of the older newer older I consoles. Wish, I really wish I could agree with you, but there is evidence that even if they didn't release anything afterwards for the most part they were considering it non-stop now you might be right their cold feet might have stopped them in each case but they were definitely thinking about it i will say that much yeah i, I could well i mean the snes cd-rom edition was definitely a, de- a good example of what you're saying but i think because there's there has to be something that made them go uh, pump the brakes like let's not do this and I'm thinking maybe past mistakes might be one of those reasons it may it definitely may well be this thing was practically fetishized in the early days of the internet because the grass is greener on the other side of the fence people didn't really know the story they just knew we didn't have it there was games on it we didn't have and it had better music and saving so if you were like on the internet in the early 90s this thing was practically would have this is like some godsend thing that we didn't get because nintendo was holding out on us they didn't want to have americans have fun no 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 we didn't get this because nintendo of america saw just how well it did in japan it's like yeah no we're good that's a bad business practice. We're not going to spend money on that. We didn't have it, so the and the grass is greener for people on their side of the fence. Everyone's like, "Oh my god, this would have been so cool." Would it have been? No. I don't you think asked so. earlier for a short answer. No, no, it would not have been good. If you think about it, they stopped making them about the time, about at least a year before the SNES came out. Even though I know it's bad and broken and will not work i'd still like to have one you and i think of a lot of other people myself eh i i i'm good i'm good i'm fine i don't need one uh it it'd be a cool little collector's object i guess maybe to put in the the nerd cave or whatever but yes and it's it's the kind of something you put behind like a, gl- a glass cage museum style it's like look what i have and yep. and and then you tell people we don't turn it on because we're preserving its integrity, but we don't tell them is we don't turn it on because it doesn't work. As seen in box. <laughs> as seen in box. Yes. yes, as seen in box. But it's still cool to look at. It's cool to look at and wonder what the hell they were thinking. It is not cool. It was a different time for, for Nintendo, for sure. Okay, I guess I guess we'll end the podcast there, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week when we do another another amazing topic this was a very cool uh learning experience even for me till then guys i want you to stay nerdy stay sexy always